so for the sake of the recording and the video, it's been a few weeks since I've been able to actively speak, so, at all. So, so I, uh, I'm going to be a little disoriented for a little while, but I think I should be able to pick up and, you know, functionally speaking in just a few minutes. By the way, um, uh, I'm going to go get some lunch afterwards. You know, I normally just, I've been doing that once a, once a, once a month, but I'm going to make an exception just because I just, you know, I'm not in a hurry to go back home for some reason. So I, I'm just going to get some food. Um, I also want to mention that um, that I've got uh, CDs in the box. It's all updated. The, the, the message that I gave last time, that's there in a previous one, which I didn't bring last week. So there's two new ones back there. Please do take those. Uh, I'm a little bit biased, of course, but I really think those were two really good messages. So please do take the time to, to, to pull those out. Uh, I, I uh, should be able to upload something to YouTube soon, you know, uh, not speaking for I get, three weeks, four weeks. It, there's a big lag, you know, in terms of uploading stuff there, there's a time lag. But the, uh, the audio CDs there, they're, they're something that you can grab right now. So um, thank you for coming. Listen, I, uh, for those of you who are not that familiar with my work, uh, this, may, this may go a little fast. Please understand that in this setting, I do make some assumptions uh, about what it is that the people who are listening believe. Uh, I make some assumptions, and so there's, there, you know, there, there may be some holes in terms of, uh, you know, I'll say something, and, you'll, and, you'll, and, you, and, and I'll leave some things out. You'll know it, I'll know it, and I'll just keep going. Um, there's also issues related to, there are a lot of things that I believe that you probably just don't. Um, I, I, you, I understand that. Please have some patience with me because I'm, I'm a very opinionated person. Uh, there are things that I, I, I understand are, are etched in jello, but from my point of view, there are other things that really are etched in stone. And, I, and I've been at, I, while I may not be new to you, this, a lot of these things are not new to me. And please try to have some understanding with regards to that. Okay, so to begin with, let's start out with uh, Isaiah chapter 5. I'm going to start in the New King James Version, um, just to give you a, a, a feel for what you're probably accustomed to. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, and I'll go to verse 4 because that's, that's the, uh, the section I'm going to be speaking on this morning, considering that I am a little, starting a little bit later than what I anticipated, uh, I probably will speak for about 40 minutes, maybe, maybe well, 45, maybe 50, and so check your clock if you need to go uh, at a certain time, please feel free to do that. Nobody look bad. Nobody look at anybody as if you know they they uh, they're not supposed to be leaving. All right. It's just, I know that some of you got things to do. I know you got jobs. Some of you got jobs you got to get to. Uh, I, I will do my best to uh, to come to end on time, but chances are it's just not going to happen. I have a lot to say. Uh, beginning in the New King James Version, Isaiah chapter five, verse one, it says, "Now let me sing to my well beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard." My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And I would keep going, but I just can't take it anymore. Um, because you, you, those of you who heard me speak on this already, it doesn't say a number of these things. First of all, it is not in the third person with regards to he. Uh, it actually is in the first... Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I did. In this case, it is. Um, he's referring to himself, though. Yeah. Uh, he's referring to himself. These are things that he did, so that's not that difficult to get through. <laughs> um, uh, when it comes to the end of verse 2, where he says, so he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes, a much better translation is to say that it brought forth a foul rot. That's the best way to describe that, in my opinion. Um, and so, you know, there is a little bit of variation in terms of uh, this translation and the one that I just passed around. As you read through it, you'll see some of those things. Now, continuing to verse 3. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, 
please between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And it kind of gives you this, this tone of, please, you know, please tell me. Would you, would you, there's nothing about that at all. He really is aggressive with this statement. He says, no, you come in here and you judge. You judge me, and you do it right now. So, you know, there's a, there's a slight difference there. The repetition of the wild grapes is, again, a repetition of foul rock. And because there is no punctuation in Hebrew, uh, in order to exaggerate a point, sometimes we will repeat sentences uh, in order to uh, be a, uh, a way of describing uh, the, the, the emphatic or the exclamation of some kind. And so he's really, he's really firm about this. Okay, so what I've handed out is a translation that I have produced from the scroll that was found at Qumran uh, for, that is housed in the Shrine of the Book. I have a copy of it that, uh, that they released to me. That This is the work that I'm doing right now as I'm translating that text from 8th century B.C. Hebrew into uh, modern English of today, which is quite a task, but that's what I do in my free time. We all have to make our decisions about what we're going to do, and that's just what I decided to do. Uh, not, you know, it doesn't mean it's any greater than anybody else's. I'm just saying that I'm just odd, as you can tell. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to read from the thought for thought, which is the second paragraph below. The word for word is, in this case, more of a transition to the thought for thought. Uh, so it can help you get an understanding of why I would throw a few extra words in there that wouldn't be there anyway, but to help exaggerate certain points. Beginning in verse 1, I will sing now for my loved one a song of my beloved for his vineyard. A vineyard was for my loved one in a horn of the sun of sacred oil. And for those of you who have not heard me speak on that, there's CDs back there. Okay? There's good stuff, all right? You should be able to see the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit right back in there. And there's a lot to be said about that. Verse 2, And He established its boundaries, and He cast out stones from it, and He planted it with a choice vine. And He built a watchtower in the midst of it, and He also cut out a wine press in it, and He waited for it to yield grapes, and it yielded a foul rot. Verse 3. And now, one dwelling in Jerusalem, a man of Judah, he's getting a little personal now, judge now between me and between my vineyard, the one that he's been working. You pass judgment. What more am I to do for my vineyard, and what did I not do for it? And of course, if you're not feeling defensive, Good for you. But they would have probably felt quite defensive about that, right? I mean, well, some people would say, all right, now it's my chance to really pass judgment against God. All right? But you know how people have different personalities. Somebody else would probably respond with, well, 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 well. <laughs> you know, and start making some, some defensive comments. People respond in different ways. What, in verse 4, what more am I to do for my vineyard, and what did I not do for it? Wherefore, I waited for it to yield grapes, and it yielded a foul rot. That's where the repetition is. Okay, so that's the translation that I've provided. Let's talk about something first, just to give a little bit of a warm-up. You know, he talks, you notice he talks a lot about sin. I mean, it's a reasonable summary to say a foul <coughs> rot, right? <laughs> but considering everything that I've presented so far from chapter 1 to here you'll probably notice that he talks about sin a lot. And he also talks about obedience with that. And for those of you who've had a reasonable degree of uh, exposure to the, the present Christian world, you've probably run into a few places that are like that, where it seems like all they talk about is either sin, obedience, or some combination of the two, right? And so it seems quite familiar. It should seem relatively familiar, but you might wonder, well, considering how much he talks about it, maybe that's his goal. Maybe that's his objective. His objective is some combination of how do we get people to stop sinning, and how do we get people to obey? 
I mean, he says so much about it, you would think that would be the case, especially, you know, when he gets aggressive with them. Right? And, and, and you've experienced people getting aggressive with you about that, too. I, I, I'm sure. And if you haven't, you've got to get out there a little bit more often. Skip a couple Sundays here. And go get yourself, you know, some, some, some places to visit. And eventually, you should get a good beating. All right, relate to that so you can relate to what I'm talking about. You need that in your life, all right? It's a very important part of growing up and, you know, living in the world. You've got to, got to get exposure to everything. There's a lot of unusual stuff out there, but there's some stuff that is unusual but very popular. <laughs> okay. Now, listen, even though he has a lot to say about it, you've got to follow through with a couple of these things. Try not to get distracted by the implications of what I say. Stick with me, okay, because I've got a lot to say. Um, you might think that this is really what his focus is. We just need to get people to, to, to stop doing those things that they shouldn't be doing and get them to do those things that they're supposed to be doing. And that that seems to be his goal and his objective in life. But I'm going to tell you, it really isn't. Because you know full well, I mean, this is easy. What is the, 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 the sin that people have in their lives? It's a foul rot. That's easy to understand. But through your knowledge of the New Covenant, which of course now I'm leaving a bunch of um, holes by saying this, through your knowledge of the New Covenant, the pursuit of obedience according to the law leads to a foul rot. Right? It does do that. There's no way to avoid it. And I've obviously, I've, you know, I have had a lot to say about that. Let me just summarize by saying that the law stirs up sin. It just stirs it up in a different way so that sometimes people can't identify it as something that they need to repent from. And so that's where it becomes complex and it becomes difficult to discover. But the fruit of the law is sin. Refer to the book of Galatians, the passage just before, the fruit of the Spirit. And you'll see the fruit of the law, which is the acts of the flesh. Those are the kinds of things that get manifested when a person pursues obedience. Some people manifest you know, things differently. You, uh, you have the natural rebellion of humanity. You have the, uh, the, the things to think about doing that we never thought about doing to begin with. And then we begin to do those things we don't want to do. You know, we have the example that we have in Romans. We have the natural uh, pride that gets developed through religious pride when a person feels they found a way to accomplish that. You get taken further away from the love of God because He's disgusted with you and you've got no alternative, but you've got to get some sin in your life okay, at that point. Because he's so disgusted with you, somebody's going to have to like you, and what's the cost of that, right? So there's a lot to be said about that. I'm just saying that the fruit of sin is obviously a foul rot. But what's difficult to see is that the fruit of the law, the pursuit of obedience, is also a foul rot. It's still in the flesh. All right? You're still trying to get your flesh under control. It's either indulge or restrain. Somewhere in between there. Indulgence of the flesh, restraint of the flesh. You're still going to end up with failure. You're still going to end up with a foul rot. The new way of life in Christ Jesus that He's opened up to us according to the new covenant has nothing to do with the flesh. It has nothing to do with restraint or indulgence. It has to do with living a life of dependency and trust in what He has accomplished. Has, it has to do with living a life with the resources that He has given to you to build life that you had no ability to do before. It has to do with being born again completely by the Spirit, being dead in Christ Jesus in the sense of being dead to the world but now being alive to Him and experiencing a new way. You can go back to the old way whenever you feel like it, you know, indulgence or restraint, but you'll still end up with the same foul rot. So, we know this, right? Well, I'm making that assumption. <laughs> okay. you gotta, you got to listen to another hundred hours of what I've produced previously to follow with me concerning that. If you don't believe me, I understand. Have some patience with me. Be Forgive me. Be merciful. Okay, whatever. But, but I'm going to take that position and move on from there in order to address these passages with the time that I've got. You'll notice that he gets kind of aggressive about the failure. What more could I do? Can you hear a sense of fear that could be expressed in that? I mean, God's got to be pretty desperate to start asking us for some ideas, doesn't he? I mean, did you notice that? I mean, he's going to have to ask us to pass judgment 
or to, you know, give us, I mean, he's going to have to be desperate, you know, to, 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 to look at someone who, who, who does not have any answers and, and, ask, and ask them to do things like, just tell me what to do. You know, I, I say that to people sometimes, and you should see the look on their face. I will do whatever you ask. You know, whatever you want, if I've got it, I'll give it to you. Here it is. Alright? Can you hear that? What do people do with that? They panic. After they take it all. Because, you know, what are they going to do with it? Okay? Besides, just destroy it. Or lose it. Or dissolve it. Okay? For the Lord to speak to the people in this way, you got to know, we're at the end. All right, we're at the end. We're at a point of absolute desperation. And if you've been around, you've heard this before, you've seen this before, and if you haven't, just you know, get out there a little more often because it's only a matter of time before the Christian leader expresses that in great frustration, if not towards you, towards somebody else, but they're going to eventually say something. You know, my favorite example was when uh, there was a guy who was trying to get me to go to his church. And I just, I, I just wouldn't go. And he was so upset. He was so frustrated. He, he did this routine. I can I can't, I can never duplicate it. The way he, he, he shook his hands as he was throwing them down to his side. He said, I wash, I wash my, my hands of you. You know, it was, it was rhythmic. Tempo was right. I mean, it looked like he had really practiced that. <laughs> Right? Okay, that's what I mean, is that eventually they get so frustrated with the failure to get you to obey, <laughs> to get you to repent. You get so frustrated that they will get so desperate that they will express that in that way. What more could I do? You know, just get out of here. You know? What more? What more? You know, I think there's some circumstances where you can say things like, I just want to just stick it out to the end. Let's see what more. You know, all the way to the end. Okay? I'm serious. This is, this is real life. If you haven't seen this in your life, I envy you. Okay? It's real life. In the religious world, it's everywhere. And when they give up you, on you, you'll feel it. Because they won't talk to you anymore. Has anybody ever experienced that? They won't open themselves up to you anymore. They give up on you. And if you want to engage them in any way, they throw that back at you in some creative way of saying, I'm just so frustrated with you because I can't get you to do the things that I want you to do. Like, stop sinning. Start obeying. And obey always. That's a very frustrating experience, isn't it? Okay? So he throws this back at him. And, gosh, there, you know, there are so many different ways that they could respond. But, uh, uh, but, but okay, but because I missed a couple of things, let me backtrack before I get to that. Okay. So he, he, he tells them that this, this is the scenario. Let's look at some of the things that he did in order to get here, in order to eliminate some of the options that they might present. He cleared the stones and he set boundaries. Okay? That's one thing that he's already tried. He cleared the stones and he set the boundaries. Now, one of the ways that we could describe clearing the stones uh, is that he removed to a degree that's the best way he could because they wouldn't cooperate as well as, you know, you, you may lead, but they may not follow. And so he led, but they didn't quite follow. And so there were a few Philistines left over, right? <laughs> They've been there ever since. <laughs> He uses them, you know, whatever they got used. So he, he, he cleared the stones of the people beforehand. That's one way to look at it. A couple, uh, a month ago or so, I mentioned that another way that he cleared the stones was by getting them out of Egypt and getting some of that Egyptian stuff out of their life. It's another way to look at that, you know, uh, to, to clear some stones by removing sin in that context or the way of living. How might he have set boundaries? I took the position that in this context, my preference, <laughs> I took the position that in this context, my preference, right? <laughs> I know sometimes I connect a little bit too much together one time in order to, uh, to avoid any, any uh, accusations. 
Okay. Um, you know, des desperate to, to you know to, to avoid that sometimes. Uh, that in this case, the boundaries were defined by the law. This is one way of saying that he cleared the stones and he established the boundaries. He established the boundaries with the law. I used the dietary laws uh, a month ago or so to explain uh, one of the ways that those boundaries were established. But you know, all the laws. They, they, they have their role in that. I just picked that one because it's my favorite. That's, that, that's all. All right, but you might find something else that's your favorite. But establishing the boundaries, establishing the rules, establishing the laws, and clearing the stones doesn't mean you're going to get good grapes. All right? I, is, even if God does it. It is that a surprise? Right? It shouldn't be a surprise. If, if you wipe out the Egyptians, it's only a matter of time before you get a golden calf. <laughs> you might delay it a little while, but eventually you get one. And you know, some people's calves are a little bigger than others. <laughs> okay? Some are a little bit bigger than others. That's all. And, uh, you know, maybe the Lord has a sense of humor. He says, you know, I think you could take a big one. <laughs> Let's see what you're made of. You know, because, because this really is a wonderful, this life is a wonderful opportunity to have great learning experiences. You know, it really is. So if you don't have any big calves in your life, good for you. <laughs> okay. But eventually you're going to get one. See, so even if you clear the stones and you set the boundaries... It's only a matter of time. The question is how long. Consider our nation, right? We cleared the stones. We set the boundaries. And how long did we last before things became different than one, 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 what they once were? About the same time as everybody else. <laughs> All right. This is nothing new. You know, one of the glorious things about studying history is that you can actually predict the future in some ways. <laughs> You know, there are some ways of, of, of doing that. And while you may not be able to have any effect on the change, or be able to have any effect on the, the ways that events may unfold, you in your own life can find ways of adapting and determining where your place will be in the midst of those kinds of changes. All right? So it's the same thing with, you know, with every aspect of our lives. And the Lord is saying that here. No matter how many stones you clear, no matter how many or what kinds of boundaries you set, not even He can get good grapes. Do you get it? Not even He can do it. Alright? Considering us. <laughs> okay. Considering us. So what does He say? He says, you tell me. Okay? You're out of ideas. When you're out of ideas, be out of ideas. Let somebody else take charge. Let somebody else lead for a while. If you lose it all, you lose it all. And I'm not saying you do that so you can shift blame. I'm saying that because sometimes there are some things that are more important. No matter what you have to give up in the flesh, no matter what you have to give up in your life, no matter what you lose that you value, in, in, in a physical sense, you know, if you find yourself in a circumstance where you sell assets, let them go. You know, if you lose your job, you look for another one. You know, there's a time to be sad. There's a time to be depressed. And if you're not depressed over something that's depressing, I would be concerned about you. <laughs> okay? But when you're done, you're done. And you start again and again, and again, with whatever you've got to work with. Alright? No matter what it is. So, he's telling them that. I'm ready for more ideas. Now, you know that there are two, generally two different kinds of people, in this case, who will respond. You've got the first kind of person who's just been waiting to unload. Right? They're just waiting. You, I mean, I could just sense this. I'll ask him later if this is actually what happened. But I, I could just sense this, the kind of reaction that they would get. Maybe you've encountered people like this, 
when you've talked with them about what, you know, what about the Lord? What about our God? And they just start to unload on you. That guy who murders millions? Look what he did to the flood! What about when he told the children of Israel to go in and kill everything that's alive? Okay? I mean, there is an opportunity for people to really lay into God when He opens Himself up like that. When He opens Himself up and says, Go ahead, judge. Go ahead, let me have it. Go ahead, get, tell me what I did wrong. You, t you judge. Obviously, you know it all. You know, every, you know all the circumstances. You know all the details. Right? You, you, you got it all together, so let me have it. That's what he says. Can you hear him? And you know that there are people who would say things like, you should have intervened in this situation in my life, and you didn't. Again, you, God, you, got, you should have intervened in my life in this situation, and you didn't. I'm, I'm thinking of a person who, if I named him, you would know him. He's a, he's, you know, he has that kind of popularity. His son died in a car accident. And he, and he carries that with him. And part of his rejection of God is because he felt that God should have intervened. Because he's not, he doesn't have the guts to say that God decided to do that. You know, there's another person who will say something, something similar. God is in control of everything. If it happened, it's because he decided that that would happen. So it's because... It's because either, if you want to take notes, it's because he either did not intervene when he could have, or he did intervene when he shouldn't have. Again, he, inter he did not intervene when he could have, or he did intervene when he shouldn't have. And you know that there would be people who would love the opportunity for him to open himself up and say, just give it to me, just, I'm listening. If I may quote Fraser Crane, <laughs> I'm listening. <clears throat> okay? You know, he opens himself up and you know it's coming, right? You know it's coming. You should have intervened when you could have, or you, uh, uh, you intervened when you shouldn't have. But uh, would that have made a difference? Do you, do you think, I mean, in, in this case, in this vineyard, when you study the law and you study the, the clearing of the stones and the boundaries, could there really have been anything better? I am not aware of anything better that he could have set up that would be so successful at showing us just how much we need him. <laughs> okay? If I may say it that way. You know, I don't know of anything that could have been more successful. If he was lighter on the law, people would have been able to find a way out. It, it, there was no need to be any heavier on the law. All right? With regards to the clearing of the stones, he gave them a fresh start. You know, if he didn't clear them all, then it just simply would have accelerated the destruction a little bit quicker. He wouldn't have been able to extend things as long as he did. You understand this? All right? Isaiah had a lot to say with response to what God had to say. This is where it is. And it's everywhere in the Scriptures. It just so happens that I'm here right now, but it's everywhere. So the people could have responded aggressively, or in this case, you know, in this way, they could have responded aggressively with God, right? And you know, you've encountered people. How many people have you spoken with about the Lord, and they react that way? All right. If you haven't encountered anybody like that, you got to talk more. Okay. Get out there more. There's lots of people who are ready to beat on God. All right. They're ready, and, and they are they are loaded, and they're just waiting for that that little opportunity to pull the trigger and let you have it. Okay. Now, what do you have the other side? You got the defensive. It's just another category. You got those who would defend themselves. And what is the most common defense? That, that I know of. You know, you probably could come up with another one. But the most common defense that I know of is I did the best I could. Alright? I did the best I could. What kind of defense is that? That, you know, I mean, that is one of the lamest things to ever say in life. 
Okay, you did the bed well, in some circumstances it's acceptable, of course, so please. <laughs> I'm sure you can find one that I would agree with you. All right, but in this context where the Lord has it, where, where the Lord has it, uh, has it, has it described, I did the best I could, okay? What, what is that? It's still a foul rot. It's still failure. So what kind of a defense is that? I tried. So, all right, you still fail. All right? You, you, what are you going to do? You're going to, if, if, you, if you reject the Lord, you're going to go up to Him and, and you're, going to, you're going to see Him in heaven. And He's going to ask, are you dead or are you alive? Do you believe in me or do, or do you not? And they're going to say, oh, well, Lord, you know, I did the best I could. <laughs> okay? What does that mean? That means I took the laws that I liked and those I did and the, you know, the ones I didn't, I didn't do and... You know that. You know that story, right? It's the same thing. It's a, it's a, it, to say I did the best I could is a manifestation of pride saying that I was great with the things that I did do. And you've got no right to say that I'm lousy because of the things I failed at because I'm so great because of the things I did. I did the best I could and that is great. Especially because you didn't. <laughs> Can you hear the religious... To me, to, to use that as a defense, no matter how much you whine, and no matter how much you cry, when you say, I did the best I could, it's still a manifestation of pride. You're still trying to claim something for yourself. You're trying to... You're, you're hanging on by a, by a toenail. <laughs> Hanging on by a toenail to what you were able to do. So don't let that defense fool you. <laughs> okay? But be polite if you want to let somebody know about that. Right? I, I, can, I can be rude right now because I'm, it's in a different context. So be sensitive to how you apply that to people. <laughs> because they just may not be prepared to receive something like that. Okay? Doing the best you can, you could, you could hear that kind of a response from them because you hear that response all the time anyway. That's what I mean, is that people may act defensively to his appeal instead of acting aggressively to his, re, to his appeal. But whether a person acts defensively or aggressively, it's still an opportunity to manifest the sin that's deep down inside of them. It's still an opportunity to manifest pride. One form of pride is obvious, and the other form of pride is not so obvious because it's concealed in tears. All right, now, that's a lot. I understand. Okay, and I do believe I'm speaking from the text. So please, listen to the audio to this again later when I'm able to... To, to manufacture it or watch the video. And, and, and when you get distracted and start thinking about your own life experience, put it on pause so you don't get, you're not thinking about something else for five minutes and you miss everything I say, which is what happens a lot, right? Okay, so put it on pause and then, you know, when you're ready to hear what's next, you know, follow through with that. And I think this will be more helpful for you. All right, so I lost my place. Where am I? Um, did not intervene to this, I could. Oh, now I know. What should our response be? I mean, if you can't attack him, and you can't defend yourself, what do you do? Confess! Right? Be honest! Be real! I can just imagine the kind of conversation I can have with him. It would probably sound something like this, right? The Lord comes to me, and he says, Look at you, Aaron! You're a disaster! You've got nothing but foul rot. After all I've done for you, after all that I've done through you, after all we've done together, look at this disaster that you've created. You have defiled my name. You have embarrassed me before the world. You know, I'm sure we could get into a good discussion about this, right? <laughs> and you know what I would say? What would I say? Would I, would I attack him? Or would I defend myself? No, the right response is to say, Yes! Send me to hell! Yes! That's right! Because that is the truth. 
That is the judgment. You want me to defend myself? Send me to hell, okay? Lord, you know, you're right. I sin. I don't obey. There's a foul rock. So be it. What more could you have done? Nothing. You did it all. Now, how, who's going to say that, right? Who's going to talk to the Lord and say, what, what more could you have done? <coughs> Nothing. You did it all, right? Only a person who knows the Messiah could say that. Right? Only a person who knows the heart of God could say that. Send me to hell. Right? Be, so be it. If that's your decision, even though you promised you wouldn't, if you decide, so be it. Because you are God and I am not. You have to know the new covenant to be able to say that. Otherwise, you know, you've got to defend or you've got to attack because you've got no alternative. So, what would happen if the Lord in His anger and in His frustrations respond, you know, speaks in this way and somebody responded in that way? So He's not saying this out of fear or out, or out of confusion. It's my opinion. I have to throw my opinion in here. <laughs> Somehow that, well, that somehow validates everything I just said. <laughs> no, don't, don't get me wrong, okay? But um, I really believe that in this way he was testing them to see if they would confess. You know, that it wasn't though he was afraid, disappointed, or that he, he didn't think that this would happen anyway. All right, I don't think that they caught him by surprise. And I don't think he really wanted their, their comments either. <laughs> I, just, I really don't think he was looking for their suggestions. I think, you know, in my, in my eyes, to me, this is like a test. And, and, and that's, the way, that's the way to pass the test. The only way to pass the test is to say, yes, mercy, please. There is nothing left. And is that so bad? Right? Clear the stones. How did he clear the stones? With the crucifixion, he cleared the stones. How did he set boundaries? Through the resurrection, he set boundaries. So he clears the stone with the crucifixion in order to, to make it possible for a new vineyard to be developed from the son, from, from the, the, the son of the horn of sacred oil, right? From verse 1. He, he's, he, he, clear, he, he clears it through the, through the crucifixion. Another vineyard. He walked away from this one. Okay, it gives the impression that he tears it apart. He didn't do that. I'll explain that next week. He, he just simply says, you know, whatever. You take it. You take it all. And see what you can do with it. And I will watch it to the end. Okay. And he describes the end. So listen. You know, he establishes... Uh, the, the boundaries through the, the he clears the stones through the crucifixion in order to make way for the new covenant, and then through the resurrection he establishes boundaries. Right? He establishes boundaries. Through, now, what are, what are the there are initial boundaries? There are boundaries, but you have to be careful how you describe them. The way that I prefer to describe the boundaries is first by establishing the criteria by which a person may be saved. Again, the first boundary established through the resurrection, if I was to pick one right now, and I might pick something later, but uh, I would say it's by establishing the criteria by which someone can be saved. And of course, there is no criteria besides mercy. That's it. Right? You, I mean, you've got to, you've got to rec recognize that doing the best you can is not where it's at. And blaming somebody else is not where it's at. Okay? I mean, there's nothing wrong with stating what's true. But if you want to go before the Lord and use that as a defense, for you, it, it isn't going to work. It is, it, is, it is the forgiveness of God through His mercy. That is the criteria by which a person may be saved. It is through the restoration of the Holy Spirit to resurrect an individual. Those are the boundaries. Now, what happens when you begin to live your life in Christ Jesus? 
What, what happens? You find some initial boundaries. And, and, and as you live your life, you find some things that seem like boundaries. You find rest. You find peace. Does that make, can, does that make sense to any of you? Can, you, can you? can you sense that? That at some point, when you are resting in the complete forgiveness of sins, freedom from the law, living in the inheritance in Christ, you enter into His rest. You enter into His rest that you are resting from your works of righteousness. And has anybody experienced that? Can I get a witness? Okay, a few people. I like to use that when I can. I don't think I can do with the right um, tone. Let me try it. Can, can I get a witness? No, that's too Jewish. No, I can't do it. I'll try. I'll try. I'm just not from that. You know, I'm not that. I'm just not that person. But, um, but you begin to enter into his rest. You begin to enter into his peace. And, and you get a sense that there's finally some boundaries in life. All right? There are finally some boundaries in, in the life in Christ Jesus where you can feel safe, right? Where you can feel secure. You know, the, the, the safety aspect of life is extremely important. You know, life can be extremely stressful. And you just, sometimes you need to have, you know, a, a break. You know, from absolute chaos that you have no control over at all. Because if you try, you're, somebody's going to hurt you. <laughs> okay? You, I mean, really hurt you. And so, you, you know, you just need a break in life. The safety within a person's heart, especially for those of us who are hypersensitive, okay, which I'm one, even though I give the impression that I'm not, that's part of my concealment of sensitivity. <laughs> okay? Seriously, you know, when we experience the peace and rest of the Lord, we feel as if we have finally found that special place, which we have, but we find we, we, we found a special place that has these parameters, you know, these walls, and that nothing can get through them anymore, nothing in the world, and in a sense that's true. But later you're going to see, if you haven't seen it yet, you're going to see that there's some openings in there and they're scary. And you will think on occasion that these openings are opportunities for the world to get in. But please consider this, that there are openings and the longer you wait, you'll see that no one's getting in there. Alright? <laughs> Just give it some time. That these openings are, are, are not openings to be afraid of. Those openings are actually more towards the heart of God. They're, they're not vulnerabilities that the world can get through. They're openings towards the heart of the Lord. And, and He won't leave you alone in that rest in Him. Again, He won't leave you alone in those boundaries, in that rest, in that peace. He's not going to leave you alone in there. He's going to constantly invade Invade in your in your life, and in that he's going to open things up in a way that you're going to you're, you're probably feel a little frightened because you got used to that peace and rest so much. He's going to open it up, up up away a little bit, and then you're going to you're going to you're going to as you live your life, you're going to walk in that, and you're going to see more about who he is, and he's going to show you more about what he sees through your eyes. And what He hears through your ears, so that you might grow to know Him more. He's not going to leave you alone. These boundaries only exist in a certain context. But there's other places where there are no boundaries. And that's the description I'm trying to give you. Is that in the New Covenant, there are areas where there are no boundaries. Like there were in the Old. In the old, there was a clear boundary. For example, there was no law that would say you would know the Lord. Now, I consider that to be a boundary. Okay, I mean, that's a serious boundary. You will never know Him. He never said that you would know Him if you obeyed. You can obey perfectly, and you still won't know Him. You can give plenty of flour in your kneading bowl. You won't, you know, you, you won't have to borrow. You just land. Right? But he didn't say anything about you'll know who I am. 
He didn't offer. He never offered that. He never said anything about that. He just said, "You'll be blessed." And I know a lot of people want to be blessed. I can appreciate that. But this is something else. This is something for which there is no boundary. And if you wonder how, you know, how can we describe that? Well, you know, there are ways of relating to that. But for the sake of time, because I have to stop. One of the ways to see that is that he keeps talking to you. He keeps showing you new things. He keeps giving you revelation. In the midst of your life experience, in the sufferings and in the, the joys, He won't leave you alone, will He? That's one way to understand that there is no boundary. Haven't you ever thought, on occasion, that you're not going to live long enough to hear all that He has to say to you? Have you ever had that thought? That's a description, it's a subtle description, and, and a reasonable one of how there is no boundary. There, there are no boundaries. It gets even better. What He does in your life is different from what He does in my life. God forbid. Well, in my case, you may not want to have anything to do with it. You may not want your life to look anything like mine. And I might not want my life to look anything like yours either, but you know, you know what I mean? Is that there are no boundaries in the New Covenant. There are no boundaries in our life in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Be thankful. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank You for this time that we could spend to review uh, what You had to say through Isaiah and Isaiah chapter 5. And Lord, I pray that You will continue to give us some insights concerning this to help us to understand the great value of turning to You more. I thank You for this in Jesus' name. Amen.